even though the context of our lives on the planet are incredibly varied, and even though we have good reason to treasure and cherish our diversity, especially evident in a city like Toronto, the fact is we all face the same fundamental reality. We are born, we live our lives, and we die. I'm here with you this evening, certainly not as an authority on matters of life and death, but as a lifelong student of life, and certainly I would say I have a passionate interest in matters of life and death. I hope to affirm what you already know and to encourage you in your own work and in your own lives. So please take what may be helpful to you from my own experience and disregard the rest. I'm going to divide what I have to speak about into three parts. I'll begin by sharing with you some of the learnings from my everyday work. And then I'd like to offer you some of what I consider inspirational teachings, some guidance from a few of my favorite mentors. Perhaps they're also some of yours. And last of all, I will speak about what I have called hard truths from the margins. In my role as a community chaplain, I am afforded a very intimate vantage point as I visit very sick and often dying individuals and their family members in their homes. And I believe I also have a, quite a, a rare opportunity in that I visit sometimes the same individuals, not only over days and weeks, but over months and sometimes years. And I say that is a rare opportunity because most chaplains work in institutional settings and are not given the chance to uh, build long-term relationships with the people they visit. So I'm, I'm very grateful for that. The visiting nurses and rehabilitation therapists make referrals directly to me and they, are, they try to be sensitive as they imagine in the visits with the people they are giving medical care to, who is in their estimation anyway, perhaps suffering not only physically, but also facing emotional, mental, spiritual anguish. <coughs> Individuals who may be feeling very isolated, lonely, overwhelmed without adequate support, fearful, depressed. And um, I would just add that I visit people of all faiths and also many people, and I would say actually more people, who profess to have no faith, no denominal faith. And I am equally inspired by both. So, uh, beginning with some of the learnings from my everyday work. Well, they are countless. So I've just drawn out five. And uh, for the, for the uh, limitations on our, our time constraint this evening, obviously, and hopefully the five that I've drawn out will uh, have some resonance for you. Number one, draw near. Be humble, but be bold. People who are very sick and preparing to die are <coughs> suffering a crisis not only of health, but on every uh, level of their human being. And along with this uh, precipitous change of everyday life for them, 
they may well be suffering tremendous experience of grief, of loss, of isolation. In the weeks leading up to death, people I know often will be experiencing a sense of living on the edge of the land of the living. And that can be a very lonely place to be. These overwhelming feelings, which are the whole spectrum of them, is very, very natural and, and even very necessary for a time. But they are intensified when friends and family members pull back, when they keep a safe distance, at the very time when a proximity of love is most needed. And I'm sure each one of us, in our own growth and self-knowledge, may be quite aware of the ways, the subtle ways, and perhaps even overt ways, in the face of suffering or another's pain, we have of retreating, of drawing back. Within families, you may often see what has been called a dance of protection. And I'll give you an example of that. Even on the telephone, let's say a daughter who is uh, a primary caregiver of her mother who is dying may say to me in a loud stage whisper, whatever you do, don't talk to my mother about death. Okay? And in my own experience, most people who are preparing to die are fully aware that they are dying. And um, so the daughter, for the best of reasons, is trying to protect her mother. The mother, sensing the daughter's disease, may uh, really not address matters of grave concern to herself. And so, uh, of course, my concern in coming into a situation like that would pr primarily be for the person who's dying. Uh, their feeling of isolation and loneliness may be quite intensified by that dance of protection. Of course, the daughter needs support too. Another way that this um, distancing may be evident is in a lack of touch. And we tend to think that that is more likely the case in an institutional setting, in a hospital setting. But I've witnessed a lack of touch even within a home setting. Sometimes, for very understandable reasons, you know, family members may be worried that their touch will inflict some pain. But more often than not, it's kind of a, a retreating, a, a stepping back. Uh, in fear and in preparation for uh, such a great loss. I can say that for those who draw near, there is sorrow but no regret. A second learning I've had is that the people who are suffering because of their state in life have a tremendous capacity for compassion and compassion for others who are suffering. And usually, uh, the more radically an individual is suffering, the deeper their compassion, the deeper their awareness that there are always other people suffering more than them. That's a very, uh, very powerful uh, thing, you know, to sense that in visiting someone. Time and again, I have witnessed someone who is very sick and uh, perhaps dying being deeply moved to learn about the circumstances of anyone else's suffering. And I've also seen how people thrive and really flourish when they're given an opportunity to contribute somehow to the lives of those around them. And I'm going to give you a specific example of this. It's, uh, it was a very dramatic uh, circumstance in, in which I was uh, taught this. 
uh, quite an elderly German woman I was visiting who had very, very many and very complex health issues, was expected to die quite soon herself. I was visiting with her one day and it just so happened that the very next person I was going to visit was what I would consider uh, to be someone in a situation of quite radical suffering. I was going to visit a young nurse who had just been in an automobile accident, lost both of her hands, and had attempted to take her own life on four occasions. So it was going to be my very first visit. And I, perhaps needless to say to you, was feeling quite anxious. I really wondered how I would be able to offer support to this young woman. And um, I certainly didn't want to be the cause of a fifth suicide attempt in my attempts to try to give support to her. So I decided with the older German woman that I was with uh, to, to let her in on this knowledge that I had of where I was going next. And I said, Waltrude, I want to ask you to do something for me just before I leave. And without telling her the full name of the person I was going to visit, I told her the circumstances of the young woman and asked would she be uh, kind enough to pray for that young woman and would she also pray for me that going into the situation I would uh, be able to be of support to her. In all of my subsequent visits up until Valtrude's own death, the first question she asked me upon entering her home for all my subsequent visits every second week was, how was that young woman? I've been praying for her. And interestingly, her visiting nurse left me a message saying, Susan, what is going on with Valtrude? I am, you know, I go in to check her vital signs and I am finding her a person <laughs> transformed. She seems to be really quite energized and focused and alert in ways that I have not seen her before. That's beautiful, eh? The Dalai Lama has said, compassion only occurs between equals. Compassion only occurs between equals. And I think really it's our compassion, any measure of it, that saves us. The only people I have visited who I consider to be in extreme pain at the moment of their death are people who've been in rather extreme pain through all of their lives, all of their living. <coughs> so there's a way that compassion and being given that opportunity, as I say, to contribute to the very end of life, to the welfare of others, our, our uh, exercise of compassion actually saves us. It saves us from a preoccupation and kind of a limited focus on our own suffering and our own pain, which tends to have the effect of magnifying it. Another teaching, be present. Someone has coined the phrase, don't just do something, stand there. And there is a tendency, I certainly recognize it in myself, uh, when in difficult situations, keep busy, keep very busy, you know, occupy yourself, try to be useful. But there is a profound value in keeping vigil and in silent prayer. And I think, uh, I know this for a fact, the communities of L'Arche have uh, made, I'm sure, a lasting impact on numerous hospital staffs who have watched whole communities standing vigil while a core member uh, dies. It is our presence that will be felt and remembered. 
long after our words are spoken. And I think that words that don't come out of stillness and listening and silence probably, you know, won't bear much fruit. I, uh, I think part of our presence, too, is how we look with kind and generous eyes. It's an unspoken communication. The husband of a woman I visit, so the woman, his wife, is dying of cancer. The husband came running out to the door uh, in one of my first visits with his wife, just as I was leaving the house, and he had a photograph taken many years previously of his beautiful wife. And with tears running down his face, he said, she's so disfigured and deformed. I, I can't put these two things together. I, I've already lost so much. Look at how beautiful she was. And in the little conversation we had and in the ensuing weeks, what I was trying to support him in coming to an understanding of was that his primary task now was to look in such a way at his wife as to reveal her everlasting <coughs> beauty to him. In being present, it's important that we don't ask too many questions of the sick person or the dying person. <coughs> We don't ever force someone to speak or, you know, at the end of their lives, expect them to suddenly be very conversant and articulate about their feelings. If it should happen that that's been a struggle for them all their lives. I say to people I visit, you know, you don't have to be anxious in anticipation of my visits wondering, oh my gosh, what am I supposed to talk about with Susan today? I say, I'll do the dance. You just, whatever comes forth in words or otherwise, that's, that's what you'll, you'll bring. But the pressure is not on you. Um, we all know the pain of not being listened to, of not being heard. In a way, not to be heard is not to exist. I would encourage you all, too, as you accompany uh, others who are dying, to be good gatekeepers, not to allow visits to be too long when someone's energy is fading, and also to allow dying persons, even though you may be standing vigil, uh, how valuable is the time for all of us that we have in solitude. That we, that we spend alone. It's important to safeguard that too. The fourth teaching, help me remember the good, the meaningful, the true, the funny, the sacred. I believe this is an unspoken cry of persons who are dying. And many times I've witnessed how calming and how energizing it is when a person who is preparing to die recalls cherished events and persons uh, from their lifetime. One of the most life-giving and joyful activities that I have in my work presently is in listening and gathering in the stories, being the scribe uh, to help people write their memoirs or letters uh, to their children or their dearest friends when they no longer have the strength to do that. For anyone to tell the story of their living and to have that story <coughs> listened to uh, in a respectful uh, manner and you know, with sincere interest conveys to that person a sense of the meaningfulness of their lives. And I think it lessens uh, grief and anxiety. This sort of exercise in, in your own communities, you know, let yourself go wild with creativity there. It doesn't have to be words. Uh, 
there are many ways I know, and perhaps Jane will be touching on some of them, but ways to, to celebrate the story of someone's life. But in these creative endeavors, in a way, it's a wonderful way to address some of the really critical and most fundamental questions and um, desires and needs that a person might have. Who do you wish to thank? Is there anyone you'd like to say you're sorry to? Is there anyone you need to express your love for? And the fifth teaching comes from my favorite, Uncle Don, who died a couple of years ago. A very, very close person to me throughout my life, my first babysitter. And Uncle Don had a lot of tragedy in his life but he was a remarkably loving and forgiving and tender-hearted man. And so I asked him, pretty close to the time of his death, you know, what could he, what could he teach me? What, what was kind of a guiding principle in his own life? Could he pass that on to me? And he said, he just came out with it, treat everyone as if their heart is broken, because it probably is. And now a word from my sponsors, my mentors. I am sure that some of them will be uh, your mentors too. But first of all, from a very uh, reputable source and certainly from a person who knew so much about suffering, from the book of Job, Job's friends who had heard of his troubles met together to go and console and comfort him. When they saw him from a distance, they did not recognize him, and they raised their voices and wept aloud. They sat with him on the ground seven days and seven nights, and no one spoke a word to him, for they saw that his suffering was very great. If you would only keep silent, that would be your wisdom. Henry Nouwen said, we have a tendency to think that the value of our presence depends on what we say or do. But it is this preoccupation with performing well that prevents us from letting go and letting God speak through us. The spirit creates in us a sacred space where the other can be received and listened to. The spirit prays in us and listens in us to all who come to us with their sufferings and pain. A great mentor of mine has been Roshi Joan Halifax, a Buddhist who has accompanied dying people for the past 35 years. And she's very, she kind of comes out with these very pithy, down to earth uh, things. I, I love it, it's very kind of grounding wisdom. Uh, one of the things she says about people in their accompaniment of those who are dying is for our work, we need a strong back and a soft front. It's good, eh? And this is so powerful and critical, this teaching. If you forget nothing, if you forget everything I say and remember this, that would be great. She says, it is important not to place a higher value on any particular kind of death. We need to be careful of the concept of a good death, since it places a burden on the dying person. That really speaks to me. I have to bite my tongue about that, even the phrase, a good death. I think that comes, you know, it's kind of common parlance now. Um, but this places a burden on the dying person. What if I fail? I don't want to be judged on how I die. And I can tell you, this is a very public confession, 
I see incredible courage in the people I visit every day as they die. I know that I mean I'm pretty sure I'm not going to be nearly so courageous as many of the people I see as I lay dying. And Roshi Jones says the danger is when our expectation of a good death is not realized, when it's not happening, aversion, rejection, and impatience creep in. I've seen that. Hasn't he died yet? Our emphasis, she says, is not only to be on clinical and intervention, but on offering a relationship of trust. Let the sick or dying person take the lead. Remember, the most important things caregivers can give. Are you ready for these two most important things? No fear and deep presence. Wow. Deep presence. Well, I have not heard it described more beautifully than it has been described by Jean Vanier. <coughs> Jean writes, to love is not to give your riches or competencies, but to reveal to others their gifts, their riches, their value, and to trust them and their capacity to grow. I would add, to grow until that final breath, and wow, then the growing uh, continues. So it is important to approach people in their brokenness and littleness gently, so gently, not forcing yourself on them, but accepting them as they are with humility and respect. You're wonderful listeners. You just have to listen a little bit longer. The third part, <laughs> what I call hard truths, voices from the margins. People who are facing the most severe of life's trials and challenges are powerful teachers, if only we <coughs> hear them. And it is not always easy to listen. Each of the little vignette stories I'll allude to now happen to have medical personnel in the story. So those of us who are not nurses and doctors can, you know, maybe feel a little bit of distance that enables us to listen. But I encourage you and I'll encourage myself to acknowledge that we, each of us, is capable of the same shortcomings and the same generosity of heart and spirit. Tammy is a young mother who died of a brain tumor uh, just a couple of months ago. Tammy had, in the year leading up to her death, gone through a terrible and sad divorce. She was a single mother with a six-year-old daughter, and she was also one of the most renowned physicians in the area of supporting children with developmental needs uh, in North America. So at 30, 32 or 33 years of age, incredibly competent, passionate about her work. And when on the very first visit I had with Tammy, she said that the greatest shock and disappointment to her had been her discovery that there was no room for the expression of her anger or rage to her colleagues in the medical profession. Every time she would express sadness or anger or rage, she felt she had a lot to be angry about, such a competent person, losing competency day by day and watching herself, you know, within the prison of her body. Every time she brought this uh, anger out, 
she was told that she needed to go to the psychiatrist to be medicated. So I felt that at the very least, I needed to provide a non-judgmental space for her to voice her anger. She did. And when she had done that, it, something shifted for her, and she was able to direct her energies to uh, very important tasks that were still at hand in the weeks before she died, writing the story of her life and creating a beautiful letter for her daughter. So Tammy taught me the importance of learning to listen in a way that includes everything. James. James uh, is still alive. He is 22 years old and uh, doesn't have long to live. In his second year of training to be a nurse, James was diagnosed with testicular cancer, which has now metastasized to his liver, lungs, and brain, 22 years old. And James actually knew that I was coming to speak to you tonight, and I said, what could I pass along? You know, you're going to be one of my hard truths from the margins. And he said, he feels he, you know, if he could just go back to his nursing training, he'd really have a word to say to his fellow nurses. But I think it's a word to all of us. His first medical oncologist came into the room in the hospital where James was sitting in the bed and said, your, the cancer has spread to your liver. Is there anything else I can do for you? and left the room. James told me how devastating that moment was because he felt so alone <coughs> and abandoned. I said, what, what would you have needed that doctor to say? And he said, I needed him to take my hand, look me in the eyes, tell me how sorry he was about what was happening to me, assure me that he and a whole big team of people would be working very hard to help him, and that he'd be back the next day, and the next day, and the next day for when I needed to speak more about it. <coughs> Presently, thankfully, um, James has an oncologist who says to him, James, we're going to be very courageous, we're going to be very strong, and we're going to face this together. Sheila is the wife of a gentleman who died uh, maybe six months ago of cancer, and her hard teaching, if you will, from the margins, is that every second week, over two-year period, she accompanied her husband to the chemo unit of a very large hospital in Toronto. In that entire time, and she was the only caregiver who accompanied her husband, in that entire time, no nurse or any person ever acknowledged uh, that, wow, this must be hard for you. Too. She said, I didn't need a nurse to come home and make dinner for me. I understood how hard everybody was working, and I even knew that they knew how hard it was for me, all of this, watching my husband suffer in this way. But she said it would have meant so much to me if even one person had put their arms, uh, an arm around my shoulder, and said, this must be very difficult. She said, I had a supportive family and wonderful friends, but what if, I, what if I didn't? What about the people who don't? So that's a call for all of us, I think. My last little story is uh, concerning a five-year-old boy who suspected from the tragic expression on the faces of his parents that his death was imminent and so he decided to ask his doctor if this was the case. 
and his doctor and he were alone together and the little boy asked, am I going to die? And the doctor said, you're very, very sick and I'm so sorry, but all of the treatments that we've tried to give you don't appear to be working. And then the doctor asked the little boy, are you afraid? And the little boy said, are you afraid? And they decided that they were not. The next day, the boy's parents came back to the hospital and he told them, I don't need you to worry about me anymore. No matter what happens, everything is going to be all right. The boy's parents asked why he felt that way. His simple and moving reply was, because my doctors love me. I will close this little opening portion uh, by offering you an excerpt from a poem by my favorite uh, poet, Mary Oliver. And I would like to offer her beautiful words as a tribute to the persons in your own life, your beloved uh, circle of friends and family members. So we'll offer this uh, in their memory, the memory of your ancestors, my ancestors, and for all of those who are presently going before us into their death. When death comes, I want to step through the door full of curiosity, wondering what is it going to be like, that cottage of darkness, that cottage of light. And therefore, I look upon everything as a brotherhood and a sisterhood. And I look upon time as no more than an idea. And I consider eternity as another possibility. And I think of each life as a flower, as common as a field daisy and as singular. And each name, a comfortable music in the mouth, tending as all music does towards silence. And each body, a lion of courage and something precious to the earth. When it's over, I want to say, all my life, I was a bride married to amazement. I was a bridegroom taking the world into my arms. When it's over, I don't want to wonder if I have made of my life something particular and real. I don't want to find myself sighing or frightened or full of argument. <coughs> I don't want to end up simply having visited this world. Thank you. <laughs>